for um, mixing up papers. Um, that's all. They are all numbered there. That's right. Um, so good evening. Um, welcome to King's College and to the Chief of the Air Staff's Freeman Air and Space Institute inaugural annual lecture. Um, my name is John Gearson. I'm Professor of National Security Studies here at King's and I'm uh, Director of the Freeman Institute, or FASI as we call it, and alongside me is our Executive Director, uh, Dr. David Jordan, um, who will be helping with the Q&A later. On housekeeping, can I just uh, direct you to uh, the fire exits, which are here at the bottom, and there are similar doors where you came in at the top. If there is a, a, an alarm, uh, it's not a drill, and please follow the green uh, signs to leave the building. Um, the session tonight is being recorded, and both the uh, remarks by the Chief of the Air Staff and the Q&A will be on the record um, as we move forward. Um, just briefly, by way of introduction to FASI, um, this is an initiative of the School of Security Studies here at King's College London, where we provide independent and we hope original knowledge and understanding of air and space issues, um, thanks to the support of the Royal Air Force and uh, through their partners, uh, DSTL, the Defence Science Technology Laboratory. We're named after Sir Wilfred Freeman, um, an Air Chief Marshal from uh, the 1930s and during the Second World War, uh, who played a central role in the development of various successful aircraft, um, which many of you know, here will know, such as the Spitfire and the Mosquito. Um, but more importantly, in a way, for the strategic level, was the central planner of the wartime aircraft economy, one of the largest state-sponsored industrial ventures in British history. We are focused on identifying, developing, and cultivating the next generation of air and space thinkers uh, in academia, but also in the practical contexts. And as part of that, we're delighted that we have our first three FASI-funded PhD students with us tonight. The first time they've actually met each other, thanks to COVID, um, but they're here uh, in, in the hall, um, and we're delighted to be actually able to fund that sort of long-term uh, approach to, to original thinking um, as we move forward. But we also have ambitious plans to support far more students on air and space matters in the coming years to diversify the sector and encourage new entrants. And there'll be more about that in the future. Um, our online events and now thankfully in-person events have already attracted a lot of attention, which we're pleased about. And we've followed that of course with our publication schedule with over 20 papers already published. And our latest one in a few days, I believe, um, will be on information power by Wing Commander Keith Slack. Turning to tonight's theme then, uh, in advance of COP26, um, FASI supported the RAF in a number of facilitating events, drilling into the ambitious, if I may say so, Chief of the Air Staff, net zero 2040 target. In early October, we held a dedicated round table event with the RAF's Chief of Staff Capability and Marshal Link Taylor, who I think is with us this evening. And that brought together uh, those leading on the delivery of net zero 2040 for the RAF with industrial and commercial partners uh, debating the challenges of getting a military air force to net zero. And then later in October, we also facilitated the first meeting of the Global Air Chiefs Climate Change Collaboration, which was hosted by Air Marshal Andy Turner, Deputy Commander Capability. And that saw 40 air forces from around the globe come together virtually and some in person with representatives here at King's to discuss initiatives such as fuels, training, infrastructure, and resilience. So we're delighted on the basis of that work so far to have tonight's speaker, the Chief of the Air Staff, Sir Mike Wigston, building on those discussions in his presentation on Net Zero 2040, the challenge for the Royal Air Force. I'm going to hand over to Dr. Sophie Antrobus, our research associate here at FASI, who will introduce Sir Mike. Good evening, everybody, and thank you so much for coming out on this chilly night. It's absolute pleasure and delight of mine to be the person who's introducing Air Chief Marshal Sir Mike Wigston to an, an evening of firsts, the first in-person event FASI's ever held uh, because of COVID, uh, and the, the first annual lecture, and we hope there'll be many more. Uh, it's absolutely lovely to have you here, Sir Mike. Um, I, I, a little bit about Sir Mike's background. I'm not going to read out your entire biography because we will need to listen to you, not me. Uh, Sir Mike joined the Air Force in uh, 1986 on Oxford University Air Squadron, uh, became a tornado pilot in 1992, 
Uh, some highlights of his command tours included commander of OC-12 Squadron. He was also the boss of 903 uh, Expeditionary Air Wing in Basra and commander of British Forces Cyprus. He was also assistant chief of the air staff uh, at the time, around the time of the 100th anniversary of the RAF and was very much involved in that, I know. Um, personally, uh, uh, one important thing that uh, Sir Mike has done uh, it, for me um, and for other, other people in the armed forces or ex-armed forces uh, was his uh, investigation into inappropriate behaviours in the armed forces. Uh, and that, since now, that report is now known as the Wigston Report and a very important and fine piece of work it was. Thank you. Uh, that, that was just prior to being appointed as Chief of the Air Staff in the summer of 2019. Uh, and um, John, Professor Gearson has mentioned uh, the ambitious targets that uh, Sir Mike has set for the Air Force. They are ambitious in diversity and inclusion terms as well, which I know is very important to you in terms of improving the number of women and ethnic minorities in the Royal Air Force. But here uh, we're going to be talking about a specific ambitious target, Net Zero 2040. It is such a pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much for giving us your time. Thank you. Uh, Air Chief Marshal Sir Mike Wigston. Thank you. Thank you, Sophie, and thank you, John, for that uh, for that introduction. And I, I will, uh, when we get to Q and A, I am doing them on the record. Um, that that means that I'm prepared to to take a sort of wide ranging view. I'm here to talk about net zero, but I'm happy to talk about anything which is in my area of responsibility. And sort of recognising that we are sort of limited on time, but uh, I'm happy to take the qu questions wherever you would like to go. But I'm absolutely delighted to be here for this inaugural. Uh, uh, Freeman Air and Space Institute event and uh, and this important Royal Air Force Net Zero 2040 event. Um, thank you to the Freeman Institute for hosting and facilitating. And I hope by the end of this evening's discussion, you will understand why I'm and how I'm pushing for that ambitious, as you've heard, Royal Air Force target of a, of a Net Zero Air Force by 2040. Some of you will have heard me speak at July's Global Air Chiefs Conference, and, and some of you will also have heard me acknowledge that I could be seen as crazy as an air and space chief talking about sustainability. And five years ago, I would probably have agreed. But now, the imperative for change could not be clearer. Our politicians demand it of us, our public demands it of us, and the young people in the Royal Air Force today the next generation Royal Air Force demand it of the leadership team and me. In the words of this year's integrated review, climate change is a transnational challenge that threatens global resilience and our shared security and prosperity. Significant action to decarbonize the global economy is required urgently to prevent climate change from accelerating rapidly and possibly irreversibly. We know that our armed forces are responsible for a high level of emissions. And within that, our air and space activity represents a significant proportion, aviation fuel burn especially so. In the UK, current government legislation requires greenhouse gas emissions to be net zero by 2050. But I've set the Royal Air Force the ambitious challenge of being climate change resilient and net zero by 2040 because everything I see and hear tells me that we need to get ahead of this now. The way we power our aircraft, the way we power our bases, and the way we hold to account our supply chain and our industrial suppliers about their own carbon and sustainable practices are the things that we're going to have to tackle. We also need to understand how our people, equipment, critical resources, and supply chains will need to adapt to operate in a climate changed future environment. We're aiming for our first net zero airbase by 2025, a net zero estate by 2030, and a carbon net balanced air force by 2040. None of this will be easy. There are complex and wicked challenges ahead of us as an organization. And I'm conscious that this is not something that the Royal Air Force can achieve in isolation. It will take decades. It will require collaboration. It needs ambition and we need to start now. Our net zero 2040 strategy comprises 
three principal strands, net zero aviation, net zero estates, and net zero business as usual. I'll start with net zero aviation because aircraft fuel burn is by far and away the greatest challenge that air forces will face to get to net zero. The same is true for airlines and the commercial aviation sector. We estimate it accounts for up to three quarters of the RAF's carbon footprint, which in turn is just under half of the Ministry of Defence's carbon footprint, which in turn is just under half of the government's carbon footprint. My jet fuel challenge is defence's challenge and it's the government's challenge. A lot of what we do, what, what we will do, will be on the back of the commercial aviation sector. And the UK has taken a world leading position in that regard. I sit on the Jet Zero Council, which brings together leaders from across UK aerospace and aviation under the Secretary of State for Transport and the Secretary of State for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. We will continue to push for increased effort commercialising sustainable aviation fuel production. That's fuel that's made from feedstocks such as ethanol or recycled waste oil, and making sure it's cost effective, affordable and readily available. Our Royal Air Force platforms are already able to operate on a 50% blend of sustainable aviation fuel or SAF. And for some platforms, we're pushing with industry for 100% SAF flight as early as next year. Some of you will have seen that we flew their Royal Highnesses, the Prince of Wales and the Duchess of Cornwall to Jordan on the first leg of their current Royal Tour in our Vespina VIP aircraft with a sustainable aviation fuel blend. So this is already happening. If there was an assured affordable supply now, we would use it. But the challenge in the short to medium term is insufficient capacity in the global production and supply chains. To put that into context, global jet fuel consumption is around 320 million metric tonnes in any normal year. The entire global production of SAF is currently 100,000 metric tonnes with little immediate prospect or ability to scale it upwards, and its spot price remains steadfastly around 10 times that of conventional kerosene. Some commentators have already started to express a view that sustainable aviation fuel in its current guise is not economically viable, but we must at least try to understand the challenges and the opportunities. And there is an exciting alternative in synthetic rather than sustainable aviation fuel. The Royal Air Force Rapid Capabilities Office is leading our synthetic fuel production projects, including groundbreaking advances in electrofuels. Electrofuels are not new. The process was first trialled in the early 20th century, but the technology available at that time meant that it was never in competition with refined natural crude. Today, that no longer holds true. New technology and different techniques have shifted that balance, and synthetic fuels offer increasing promise. The new approaches to synthetic fuel production are environmentally friendly and sustainable. They offer sovereign security of supply and the chemically pure fuel we are producing indicates that we will have cleaner engines that result in lower maintenance, longer equipment life, lower noise, heat, and visual signatures such as contrails. The RAF Rapid Capabilities Office has two separate synthetic fuel projects both of which are making exciting progress. Last week, you, have made, you may have seen that the Royal Air Force and our ind industry partner, Zero Petroleum, won a Guinness World Record for one of those projects for the world's first successful flight using only synthetic fuel. Zero Petroleum's synthetic petrol is manufactured by extracting hydrogen from water and carbon from atmospheric carbon dioxide. Using energy generated from renewable sources like wind or solar, the hydrogen and carbon are combined under heat and pressure with metal catalysts to create the synthetic fuel. Yes, we are making fuel from air and water. It is alchemy, and the Royal Air Force and Zero Petroleum have proved it can be done. This world record achievement was a result of collaboration with brilliant scientists, engineers, designers, and small and medium enterprises across the length and breadth of the UK. As well as a glimpse of the future for fuels, it points to how we will crack the net zero challenge as a national and international endeavor. 
and the leading role that UK science and technology can play in that. I've spoken about sustainable and synthetic fuels, but there are other alternatives to petrol and jet engines, such as electric or hydrogen propulsion, particularly for our smaller, lighter aircraft like training aircraft. We aim to have our first zero emission aircraft operational by the end of this decade. And I think it's entirely appropriate that this aircraft will be for our air cadets, our university cadets, and the very first stages of flying training. If we achieve that, it will be the first military registered and certified zero carbon air aircraft in the world. The second strand of our strategy is net zero bases. Our pilot project is Royal Air Force Leeming in Yorkshire, and we're aiming for it to be our first net zero airbase by 2025. It will require alternative power sources such as solar, geothermal and hydrogen, and we will make the most of the large land area our bases cover. We're looking at how our runway maintenance program could be modified to, in to include ground source heat pump technology, or how we install photovoltaic cells on our hangar roofs. We're using RAF Leeming to understand how we do this. We'll prove the technology and test the results there, then roll it out across the remainder of the Royal Air Force by the end of the decade. With our bases currently responsible for around 25% of RAF emissions, achieving a net zero estate by 2030, and then beyond that moving to net negative and offsetting our aviation emissions is a critical element of the RAF strategy and achieving that net zero 2040 ambition. From an operational perspective, that independence from the national grid and from energy supply makes us much more resilient too, better postured to defend our skies and space into the future. I also recognize the obligation on the Royal Air Force to support other national initiatives to hit the UK's ambitious climate change goals. The UK's offshore wind industry is set to generate 40 gigawatts of power by 2030, but the relationship with the Ministry of Defence hasn't always been easy. These offshore wind farms act as complex spinning radar reflectors, confusing our ability to maintain a clear radar picture that we need to monitor and keep our skies safe. Historically, we've objected to such developments, but in recent years, the MOD, led by Air Vice Marshal Link Taylor, sits on a joint board with the Offshore Wind Industry Council, with each partner determined to find a way that air defence radars can operate effectively alongside even the largest of wind farms. Our net zero ambition is a great ambition, but there will be risks and trip hazards along the way. We are a fighting force that must continue to protect our nation, something that we cannot compromise on our way to net zero. I know that there will be difficult prioritization decisions in the years and decades ahead, but if we're thinking about them now, we will be able to better navigate our way through at pace. It's not a zero sum game either. I can already point to significant operational benefits of a more sustainable force structure, whether that's operating from a home base or deployed. Renewal, renewable power generation like solar or small hydrogen power units removes the requirement for a massive fuel and logistics supply tail and the vulnerability and headaches that that attracts. And taking it one step further, just imagine if the synthetic fuel plant I described earlier could be deployable too, and we were able to make our own jet fuel at a deployed operating base or at sea as part of HMS Queen Elizabeth's carrier strike group. I'm conscious that our net zero ambitions are not something that the Royal Air Force or any organization can achieve in isolation. And we're already working with the rest of government, with industry, scientists, academia, think tanks, and other air and space forces around the globe, drawing on the power of our collective resources to address this pressing challenge. Earlier this year, we launched the Global Air Chiefs Climate Change Initiative, inviting my international counterparts to explore the opportunities for our air forces to collaborate on a global basis, sharing ideas and intent. Air and space forces from over 41 countries are already participating with eight work strands underway. I'm confident our net zero ambition and the strategy to take us there will reduce our impact on the environment. It has the potential to make us more resilient too. 
both in terms of supply chain dependencies and in terms of how our people, equipment and infrastructure adapt to a climate change future environment. It will not be easy. We will have to make some extraordinary leaps in fuel, aircraft and propulsion technology. We will have to transform our air bases and the buildings on them. It will require collaboration with many different partners and I know it will require significant investment and commitment to achieve. It will take decades, and I tell my next generation of leaders that it will largely fall to them deliver, to deliver, so they must get their heads around it now. I am proud of the leading role that the Royal Air Force has already taken in this, nationally and internationally, and I'm in no doubt we will continue to lead the way, as we have done throughout our history. We are but a small part of a much bigger societal and global effort, but it is critical to all of our futures, and I am excited that the Royal Air Force is a part of it. So thank you for listening, and I look forward to hearing your questions. Mike, thank you very much. And we're inviting questions from our participants who are on Zoom, uh, as well as from the room. So if anybody wants to uh, kick off with a question, um, and we'll also bring it online. So we have a question over here. Yes, please. Um, Mike, you mentioned Brexit. Mike, you mentioned it's quite a difficult decision to make. How are you going to manage making kind of like arms production green whilst balancing social and ethical responsibility? Yes, yeah. yeah. um, um, some, some might say, say ironic, ironic kind of saying that your arms production is going to be green, but if it's not socially and ethically responsible, what's the point? So it just seems like an attempt to greenwashing, if I must. So, so um, I, I, I absolutely, absolutely understand the thrust of your question, question. and I, I, I did hear, hear, hear the first part. I think the microphone's just for the, the online audience. But the, um, so, so, so for me, for, for, for my role, my role is to deliver air and space power to protect our nation and our allies. And, and if we accept that the world is not the place we wish it to be, that there are there are organisations, countries, uh, uh, crime crime organisations who would do us harm, and we need to be ready and prepared to protect uh, uh, people around the world. Then then there is a then, then there is a need for an air force, there is a need for armed forces. I, I mean, we can have a philosophical debate about you know, that, you know, that that founding principle, but that's that's you know, that's why I put my uniform on. It's to protect the nation. Now, if we, we can do that and we can be blind to the requirement of, you know, being socially responsible um, and we can be blind to the requirement to be socially responsible in all sorts of different ways. But I don't think that our taxpayers who ultimately fund what we do as a, you know, as a Royal Air Force or as an armed force would accept that because because ultimately I need that license to operate. I need our parliamentarians, I need our public to say, you know, the Royal Air Force, it might not be the organisation that I would choose to join. I, I might not choose to, to bear arms, but I recognise the role that they're playing defending our nation. And, and for us to have that licence to operate with our, with our public, we need to be socially responsible. And environmentally responsible is absolutely a key part of that in the future. But there are all, all sorts of other things, and some of them Sophie alluded to in her introductory remarks. And, and going to your point, I think as a uh, you know, by taking an aggressive lead in this as a service, we, we're already having demanding uh, conversations with our industrial supply chain about what, what are their plans to be net zero? What are their plans to make their, you know, their equipment delivery uh, sustainable? And you know, I'm really pleased to see that um, through in, in, even in recent weeks, a number of the prime industry, aerospace industry uh, companies have, have made those declarations. And, and so there is a sort of leadership role for the Royal Air Force in this to, to keep, keep driving that point and keep making that point. Because just the same, you know, just the same as, as if you like, my, my shareholders are the British public. Well, these, all of these companies, their shareholders, you know, they, you know, they, you know their, shoulder, their shareholders, their workforce are demanding the same of them as well. And, and I do, I, you know, I, 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 I sort of recognize why I could be accused of greenwashing but I absolutely am doing this for fundamental reasons of this is what our society expects of us, you know, even for an organization that is there to, you know, to, to defend 
the Society Against Enemies. Do you want to? <coughs> yes, thank you. Um, first of all, um, could, could I just, just um, um, ask that the roving mic would make sure it's switched off? Um, because apparently there's some echoing going through, which is causing some confusion on Zoom. Um, and a question from Tom Pashby, um, who asks, what can the Royal Air Force do to ensure their own accountability? Uh, in the pathway to net zero, uh, such as having independent environmental yeah. assessors, please. Yeah, that, that's a really good point. And, and um, in some respects, it goes, it goes back to that same point about the credibility and not just, you know, not this, this just not being you know, symbolic, um, uh, tokenistic um, statements. And a lot of the work that we're putting into it over the next couple of years is actually understanding what our footprint is and understanding, you know, putting in the measures and getting it sort of recognised by a, uh, you know, by a sort of statutory bodies that are out there. So this will absolutely be, um, you know, on, you know, it's transparent in terms of the credibility with how, with how we go about this. And I don't have any qualms about doing that. You know, we're serious about doing this, and and actually having that independent adjudication is, a, is actually a really important part of this or the the independent know-how of how how you measure it correctly Lisa Gins? envisage future, perhaps quite a near future, where you might have to trade off, um, if you like, considerations of lethality and operational effectiveness in order to put more precedence on sustainability. I mean, I sense from the Ministry of Defence's publications, and particularly uh, Richard Nugent's reports a couple months ago, sort of unwillingness to cross that Rubicon. But I think, personally, I think you might have to. So the relentless optimist in me says that um, we will find a way that we can have both, you know, and we um, and we can have it both ways. Where you, know, you, you by by taking you know, the right steps now, when we when you get to those 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 kind of difficult sort of forks in the road where we've got to make those decisions, we'll be we'll have the options to do it without compromising our operational lethality ultimately there are some things that we can do with there are compromises that we'll be able to make even in in the early stages around things like the training aircraft i spoke about i mean the, the chances are that even this decade now i might be pleasantly surprised but the chances are this decade that we won't necessarily get the endurance with a an electric powered aircraft that we had from a uh, from a petrol powered aircraft so there, there will be a compromise a price to pay for making that leap when, when we come to it. Now, that's, that's a sort of realistic chance in the next few years. I think further down the road, I, I would like to think that actually we won't necessarily have to make those choices in terms of the actual capability. Where we will have to make a choice, Peter, is around the, the price premium we're prepared to pay. And, and, um, and that's why the very clear signal from this government, given that I'm spending taxpayers' money, the very clear signal from this government means that actually we can have a conversation around something that is more expensive um, than you know another piece of equipment, but there is value of itself in the in the piece of equipment that is more expensive because it contributes to that journey to net zero. We've got clear political leadership in that regard and, and policy direction. But that, I think, is where the challenge is going to be, where we're going to be paying a premium, and a very good example of that at the moment is sustainable aviation fuel. You know, we're going to be paying a premium for that, and, and, and that will mean that our money doesn't go as far, and I think that's where the real choice will be. I don't think we're going to compromise on our operational effectiveness. We can't. I, I, you know, that's not, a, that's not something that I would, you know, a legacy that I can leave for my successors. Uh, following on from this, Mr. Bill Jassett. Yeah. Um, so that does lead us to a more direct question than Peter's, which is you, you made the remark that you know this, this is going to involve significant resources being expended to, to do this. 
Now, the Ministry of Defence is in quite a good place at the moment, having had a, a very successful uh, integrated review and a, you know, a very good settlement out of last year's spending review. So kind of the department is as flush as I can recall it at you know, any time in, in, in my career. I but, it doesn't feel like that. You know, <laughs> but it ain't necessarily going to stay that way. So I guess my question would be, um, even given the levels of political commitment that you were describing there, how confident are you that you're going to be able to you know, stay on this journey, you and your fellow service chiefs, when resources potentially get a bit tighter? You know, how much of this do you think um, survives and sustains against some of the higher priorities that you know, you know are likely to come along, yeah. including you know, additional operational commitments and the like? So kind yeah. of how sustainable is the sustainability? Yep, yeah, got it. So I, I, I completely agree. Um, and you know we we can't you know with you know with, with any certainty say what is around the corner, what um, you know where our political leadership where the, the sort of, you know where the necessity of circumstances in the future take us. But right now, everything I tell you know everything I see everything I read tells me that we've got a consensus amongst our, our you know our, our public an increasing consensus amongst our parliamentarians and absolute absolute agreement between our political leadership current political leadership that this is the journey that we're on and and going back to that that resources question you know, that resources point and again it's you know for, for those of you that don't have the pleasure of working inside a government department it's, you know, the obligation around spending taxpayers money you know, you know it, it is you know it is something that we you know, i carry you know ca carry on my shoulders and and you know and and there is a significant responsibility for me to be a careful custodian of taxpayers money and to seek value for money but value for money doesn't mean the cheapest and and value for money that value can be in in an environmental or in a in a social value sense and you know, and that's something that I, I am very you know very very persistent in sort of drumming through um i i'm in no doubt that there will be resource challenges around this but um, I, but what I don't want to do, it, you know, I, I want to start paying that premium now and smoothing it over 20 years so that my successor in 2035 or 2045 isn't cursing me for not having done anything about it and then having an almighty uh, burden to, to deal with, you know, over a much shorter space of time. Yeah. Second, we're just going to go back online. Uh, there are there are a range of questions off net zero, but we're going to stay with the net zero uh, questions first of all. And then uh, yeah, I'm looking for some people on this side as well to to come in. Right in a minute, we'll go on. We'll go online for our Zoom participants. Thank you, John. Um, question: I'll combine two of them. One from Tim Croydon, uh, who says, in terms of the metrics, how do you intend to measure environmental gains? And is there an industry standard you're working towards to meet your aspirations? And uh, one from um, someone who I suspect isn't in real life called anonymous attendee, um, who asks whether you calculate as part of this, whether um, you consider the RAF's degree of responsibility, for instance, defense systems that are shared with other frontline commands when calculating uh, your responsibility for carbon emissions. Right. Well, if, if either of those two questions are looking for a job, that's exactly the sort of questions I need to be asking because because these are very early days. But um, in in the first instance, there's already a number of uh, of uh, you know, benchmarking, uh, whether it's the, the the carbon trust or or any other sort of certified ways of measuring what your footprint is. And this is exactly what we're going through over the next couple of years, just to uh, understand what our footprint is today and then there is that challenge of course there's that challenge of of how we measure uh, our activity how we measure the equipment that we bring into service how we how we measure everything we do when we're sharing so much with the navy with the army with other international forces but i but it, it's complex but i can't help but think that there's a way through this and it's something you know it, and and it certainly should be something that puts us off it's just something else that we've got to get our heads around and you know my my, my senior leaders have to get their heads around and my junior leaders have to get their heads around because they're, they're going to be the ones that are carrying this for the next two decades. Yeah, let's go to the lady in the back row, please. Middle. Thank you. What this will mean, that there's going to be um, an acceleration of the adoption of drone uh, technology, which would have a smaller carbon 
footprint, whether forces are prepared for the unknown psychological effects of this. I would, I would turn the drone question on its head slightly and see that there is undoubted utility of autonomous or remotely crewed platforms in a future uh, battle space, a future operating environment. That is the way technology, that is where technology is taking us anyway. And, th and that enormous utility is something that we are you know, taking advantage of. And I, and I see the force, the mix of uh, the ratio of piloted to autonomous aircraft that we operate and the Royal Air Force operates over the next 20, 30 years. I see that ratio just in, inexorably uh, shifting along as a greater proportion of our of our fleet is autonomous or remotely crewed, and um, and and that and there and in that of course there is a uh, you know, there is a net zero dividend, but it's not the driver. The driver actually is the technology that allows us to protect our skies and protect our space uh, even better using what te technology allows us to do, and. Um, uh, you know, technology has, there are other advantages around technology, around synthetic training. I see a future where the, the activity that the Royal Air Force does in the real world, the you know, operations or strategic signaling on behalf of the government or our, our allies, is, is uh, you, know, you know, that continues in the real world. But all of the training that we do preparing for that is done in a synthetic environment. And of course, that, um, you know, that, of course, changes the, the amount of uh, you know our carbon footprint when it comes to training and 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 building up the forces and building up the squadrons that we're going to use. Well, thank you very much. And uh, it's very refreshing to see that the defence almost in eight months has gone from uh, proclaiming to be a fast follower to actually um, setting a pace. In not all of defence, not all, but led by the air force. Um, <clears throat> however, you, you you're very rightly. Uh, going along with uh, your colleagues in, in civil aviation in terms yeah. of decarbonisation. Um, if COVID has taught us anything, it's that there needs to, we need to plan for the odd black swan event. And the black swan in sustainable aviation may be that it, the fact that net zero fuels are still emitting carbon at altitude becomes unacceptable socially faster than the ability of the industry to come up with a, a true zero emission fuel. Now, in the civil aviation, they kind of have a plan B, which is they are already planning for the most difficult aircraft to decarbonize, the long haul ones, to be hydrogen. To meet that, that need, they'd need to bring those forward. I don't see the same in our programs. The most difficult aircraft to decarbonize are our combat aircraft. Yeah. I don't see a zero emission combat aircraft anywhere in our research programs at the moment beyond potentially concepts. Is that something we should be addressing now? So we are. Uh, so, so there is a lot of um, there's a lot of potential in hydrogen. The challenge with hydrogen is, at the moment, we haven't been able to compress the storage. So even a even a large sort of wide-bodied airliner that's powered by hydrogen looks like a bloated guppy um, when you sort of see uh, sort of computer simulations of it. Um, and clearly that's not going to work for, for a high performance agile combat aircraft. But actually if we can, you know, you know there, is, there, there is certainly something and there's certainly interesting technologies around hydrogen, but I, I go back to synthetic fuels and I'm not, I'm not betting the whole farm on synthetic fuels and we've got a long way to go, but there's some amazing technology involved in that. And some of the things I was exposed to in the run up to our Guinness World Record Flight where where we where, where we you know, flew a, flew an aircraft for, um, a, a, around the Cotswolds um, a couple of weeks ago. The um, you, you know that the the exciting nature of the the chemistry in that and what the potential is and actually the realistic um, potential for scaling up that that you know that 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 tells me that we shouldn't give up on the good old kerosene burning gas turbine just yet um, and and so there is there's a number of strands and and as i said you know to achieve this we are going to need some massive leaps in technology and aircraft design and propulsion but uh i i also freely admit that quite a lot of 
what the Air Force achieves will be done on the back of what the commercial sector has to do um, for exactly the reasons you described. I think we had a question here. So, so good evening. Um, thanks so much for your talk. Uh, kind of following on from the question you just had really is, is about developing and upskilling our people. Uh, as you mentioned already, we have some people in the room that already have that knowledge. Do you foresee us forming a uh, sustainability branch, perhaps under the professions review that will see us put the people and be resourced into leading the net zero charge? Just take another question. A couple of questions. I think there was one here. Yes, please. We'll take this one and one other just to cover the ground. Thank you. Hello. Um, I just want to say it's really great to see your level of ambition. It's very ambitious ambition. And that's really great to see. And but my question is: is um, how do you see offsetting might end up being part of your strategy? And could that be something like um, a certified scheme, or would that be something more along the lines of investing in your own lands and and an estate that you've already got? Yeah. Okay. And, and there was yeah one up here. Um, well, John's giving me a late evening memory yeah. test now. So, okay. Got it. <laughs> um, I just wanted to ask about sort of in regards to something that has been said previously, but you, you spoke about contracting in the future, uh, but what about the ongoing contracts and projects? So will those be well, obviously not cancelled? I hope not. But uh, with the equipment that you receive, uh, mm -hmm. will you be upgrading that to adapt it to the net zero um, strategy or not and then also in regards to sort of space for example rocket launches and you know satellite launches how will you be able to sort of make that net zero because we know that you know rockets are very very uh, polluting uh, one of the greatest polluters yep um could we foresee you know i don't know who you who who you guys use uh, for for the rocket launches but could we see you know uh, uh, a collab with with you know other rocket technologies yeah so um i uh uh so, so in, in terms of existing contracts um it, it it's really difficult to break i mean contracts are contracts it's difficult to break them and you've got to have a good cause and wanting to insert a, a net zero element to it but actually some of our contractors are coming forward and saying right well you know even if it's not part of the contract we you know we want to be part of this and we want you to hold us to this so it's a it's a very early conversation, but actually, I think we will be able to sweep up more and more of this as under that sort of business as usual, and and it, and it will certainly become, you know, com, you know, rules under our sort of under our sort of commercial um, process in in future. Um, in terms of space, I'm I'm in the fortunate position of the Royal Air Force is not responsible for space launch. Um, the UK Space Agency, another uh, which works for another government department, does space launch. Um, but uh, you know, I, I say that as you know, in terms of, I you know I don't have to worry about that now, but I absolutely recognise your point, and there is going to be something we're going to have to get our heads around with that uh, in the future. It looks like a really, really wicked challenge, but right now um, it's not. It's not something that I need to factor into a net, my net zero amb ambitious ambition um, uh, for 2040. Um, going going to the point about the offsetting. Uh, that that is why the investment in our estate is so important. I, as as you can imagine, I have an awful lot of uh, acreage um, in on on our bases, and and actually turning those into net net generators of renewable energy is is something that I see as a very important element of offsetting. So actually, getting our bases to zero by the end of this decade, and then moving into a um, you know, a, a net deficit um, because we are producing renewable energy, you know, which which we may use to make synthetic fuel. But um, you know, the, that that net deficit is something that will be an important element, I predict, of the calculations when we have got to that point of an accredited way of calculating what our footprint is. But using using that real estate in different ways, uh, you know, whether it's um, ground source heating or uh, the uh, vegetation that we put on it, the, you know, what we do with that land becomes a really important part of it. And that gives us choice. And that, and that final point about a, or that first question about a 
a, a sustainability branch. I don't, I don't think we need a specific sustainability branch. It's going to become a really important part of how our infrastructure uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, specialists role. It's going to become a really important part of our capability area. And, and frankly, it already is an important part of our capability area. And the leadership, and I think the Air Force's leadership in this, it, you know, it originally came from our capability area, our people looking at our future equipment and thinking about where the trends, where the societal trends were taking us and being nervous about bringing equipment into service that actually our public would reject in 20 years time because it was too, you know, uh, too much of a carbon footprint. You know, these, th those were the, were the sort of far-sighted profits of our organization and they were the people that first started talking about it. So I do see it as across the whole, uh, across the whole organization that, um, that we have that, uh, you know, that, that responsibility, but there'll be specific areas that will have a greater role, but I don't see a, a, a standalone branch in those terms. So um, we're going to have to pull, call, uh, pull stumps up at this stage. And I'd like to invite uh, Julia Baum, our first uh, PhD studentship holder, to uh, give the vote of thanks. Julia. So I'll, I'll sit down. Yes, please. Hello, everyone, and I'll wrap up quickly. Uh, it's a real honor to give a vote of thanks tonight. And as mentioned, as the first PhD student in the Freeman Institute, uh, it's quite satisfying to watch the Institute grow through events like this, especially in person. Uh, thank you to the Air Chief Marshal Sir McQuiston for an insightful lecture. Uh, it was particularly interesting to hear insight into the ambitious uh, net zero target by 2040, but especially the part on how it's not a zero sum game. Nothing, uh, or noting the benefits of renewables and synthetics, including making fuel with air and water was particularly interesting. Tonight has given me hope for the ways we use technology to both protect and benefit Earth, and I'm excited for the continued growth of green military agendas. And finally, a thanks is due to the audience members here tonight, both in person and also online. Uh, thanks for dedicating your Tuesday evening to this lively discussion, and thanks to those in the Q&A contributing thoughtful and provoking questions tonight. So have a great evening, everyone, and let's give a final round of applause for Cats.